I don't think I've been inside this church in more than 30 years. We look at the windows. You can never think something bad might happen here. The participants in the film, so subjects, are six main guys, and there's also uh, several family members and therapists and also other people who are sort of supportive. The answer to how big our crew was sort of varied depending on what kind of thing we're filming. So sometimes it was as small as like me, camera, sound, couple producers, sometimes as big as 50 extras, 70 extras, and lighting and grip and everything else. So it definitely fluctuated based on what kind of thing we're filming. We use the FS7, Sony FS7 with prime lenses, like very old school prime lenses. I have not counted the hours. I do know that we had a six hour cut at the beginning of this process. Drama therapy is the intentional use of role play to achieve a therapeutic goal. We're trying to walk through each other's memories and the things that haunt us the most. Each survivor is writing their own script. You worked with people doing drama therapy before, but when did you originally find out about this drama therapy? It's interesting to frame it that way because I didn't know we were doing drama therapy before. Our last film was a film called Bisbee 17, and we were staging this large-scale recreation of a historically traumatic event with hundreds of extras in town. When watching this film, someone at a Q&A just said, well, did you have therapists there? And my answer was completely inadequate. I was like, well, no, we didn't really need them. We knew we, all the people. And then I kind of looked back at what we did and it was very clear that we should have had therapists because what we were doing was opening up all this sort of traumatic memories, all these family histories, all this stuff. And we weren't doing it correctly, basically. My sister-in-law uh, said to me, well, have you read the book, The Body Keeps the Score? And that took me down a whole sort of spiral of like this sort of almost like a crisis of like, why do I make the films that I make? Why are they what they are? And what can we do with that? And that led me to see, when I saw the, the press conference, it was kind of like a light bulb had gone off and it was, I, I knew we could dive in. I mean, I think before I was effectively practicing unlicensed drama therapy and I didn't know it. And so the way we kind of think of it is that drama therapy influenced what we're doing. And really what we're doing is finding the sort of cathartic value of making a movie together, which is, you know, beautiful in and of itself. In my mind, it's like, they're not going to win. And that's how I cope with it. Uh, do I have concerns? Yes, I have concerns being re-traumatized. If it's too painful, we shouldn't do it. I need to conquer these, these fears. So why these survivors and why these stories? I have three amazing producers, Bennett Elliott, Doug Trolla, and Susan Bedusa. And Bennett and I got on the phone with Rebecca Randalls, the lawyer that you see in the film. And we started talking to her about these ideas. And she was excited by it and skeptical. And it took a really long time of talking through what we were thinking, what she was thinking to kind of find some sort of safe place to start, really. The reason why these six guys is because she cast these six men. She said, these are the guys that I think need this and can do something with this and most importantly can handle this. My pitch wasn't that I can tell your story. My pitch is that we will tell it together. And I know that that sounds like, oh, well, of course you said that, but Truly, it had to be that. Part of the pain comes from power being taken away. And one of the things that Rebecca told me early in the process, it's like, as long as you don't take their power away, as long as you listen to them, as long as you let them make choices, we should be okay. Because that was what they're still coping with, was how much was taken from them, right? And how much power was removed from their lives. We have over 230 priests that we know of that have been sexually abusive in this area. Catholic Church says, tell your mother we're sorry. You tell my mother you're sorry because she still believes in you. They are on set, casting, they're making storyboards, they're just so involved in every aspect of cinema when they, have, besides Dan, have not been involved in this world at all. How did you get them interested in drama therapy, interested in making a small movie about their most private moment or one of their most private and horrific moments from their past. Every room we metaphorically built had several doors. You could always escape. You could always leave. You were never locked into this process. It wasn't like, 
hey, hey you got to trust me because you've now signed over your life rights. And we're and if you don't want to do this, so sorry. The real answer to your question is trust was never built in one sentence or one pitch or one moment. It was built over continuously seeing it. And then we started seeing results, which you see in the film. Ed said, hey, I don't know, maybe it would be cool to go back to this cathedral where I, you know, I haven't been in 35 years and there's this bell and I'd love to ring that bell one more time. Can we do that? And we, and we said, okay, sure, let's do it. And then the guys said, you know, I see what's there. Like that was amazing. Maybe I can do that for myself because let me be very clear. They wouldn't have done it without each other and they wouldn't have done it without the camera being present. And so because that camera is present and because that brotherhood has started to be created, then it's like, well, now I can think about someone actually seeing it. If you can see me ring that bell in my church, then maybe you can do the one thing that you've been needing to do. People do things for other people. Sometimes they don't do for themselves. So are you okay being here? Somehow the stage set has oh my gosh, changed everything. It's an opportunity to take back the power of those places over us. How did you find that balance of getting what you needed to get in order to tell the story and balancing the people that you're filming's emotions and realities. It comes from, this is my seventh film, you know, and, and I've been working with the same team for a really long time. And we're, we are a family for good and bad. Sometimes like we, we fight like a family and we love like a family and we take care of each other like a family. And so that produces a lot of confidence, you know, a lot of confidence that allows you to give up power during the directing process. So during the filming process and all that, it that's rough on me. Like that is emotionally very trying. I can be very spastic. I can be very concerned. So, you know, the whole time I was having nightmares and I was having stress and all this other stuff, navigating all that, very much leaning on the team, you know, these people that I love dearly that we were making the film with, but still taking on a lot. But it all came down to the fact that I knew I could edit this film. And I knew also that I could incorporate their ideas. We showed multiple cuts to the guys. They gave a lot of feedback on the film, but the, the, the confidence doesn't come from the filmmaking side. It honestly comes from the fact that when all the dust settles, I will take this into my editing room. I will take all this footage and I know what to do. Coming down the aisle with these guys is melding me with my 13 year old self. But I feel like I have a connection to it, so I know how to take care of it. The survivors and other people working on this, this film said on camera, I don't want to do how this has been done before. What are some of those things that specifically that you've seen how um, sexual abuse and abuse, especially within the church, has been portrayed in the past and what did you want to avoid? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think it starts with Ed's line about, you know, cut to the weepy dude in the corner golf clap, right? Like he's like his his whole way of ex describing what he's afraid of. It's such an indictment of the way this story has been told and the way that we've received it in the public. The person doesn't matter. The individual human being doesn't matter. He is the weepy dude. He is the sad old man who's broken and damaged and you're cutting to him in his most vulnerable state. And then golf clap, right? Like golf clap is you, the viewer, and me, the viewer, basically saying, oh, that's so sad. Okay, I'm gonna go about my day. I think what we tried to avoid is the film is not about what happened in the past as much as it's about trying to cope with it and move forward to the future. The stories of how they actually manipulated the children are really important to hear but we've we've heard versions of it before. And I, I would have almost prefer to let the guys tell these things on an individual basis for people who see the film. Because to me, the, the difference with what has been done and what we're doing is this is about moving forward. Fixing it is not possible, but catharsis can be possible. Healing can be possible, even if making it all go away is never gonna happen. What was taken from these boys can never be given back but we can absolutely work together and, and create something new that's not about what was taken, but it's about what, what we can do in the future. <laughs> Dude. You did something that is so hard for me to do. This is a vehicle to help other guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for you.